Welcome to another CBD seminar. This is main, mainly aimed at graduate civil engineers and structural engineers. And the nice little pile drivers you see there are the typical uh, pile drivers for timber and common, commonly used in New Zealand. Uh, now, it's often made as an attachment to something like a digger like that. So the contents for today, the running order will be a little bit of background, a look at the old New Zealand building code and then into the code of practice from the Institution of Civil Engineers. A little bit of theory about where the dynamic pile formulae come from, uh, just a statement of the highly formula as well, and a little discussion on the factors of safety that we might be using. Uh, a quick look at the Redco Excel template, because yes, this is another one of those CPD seminars is what the hell is the spreadsheet doing? And then we explain what the spreadsheet is doing by looking at the MathCAD example. And then some warning words about what's excluded and comments about redriving and testing and the potential for negative skin friction in driven piles. OK, so outside New Zealand, piling rigs, particularly pile driving rigs, are big. And this is what I think of when I think of a pile driver. It's a large purpose made uh, machine for driving in piles and their piles are usually concrete or steel. Uh, we do things a little smaller in New Zealand and we put them in as uh, timber piles and timber piles are very common in New Zealand. So this is the old New Zealand building code, uh, BM, BM4 from section B1. Uh, this, and I say old because it's now been superseded with a newer version, which doesn't include this appendix. And if anybody knows why they didn't include this appendix, I'll put the answer in the chat because I don't know why. Uh, but the theory comes from, um, or is best documented, in the Civil Engineering Code of Practice number four back in 1954. Now, this is an updated version done by Alastair Beale and converted into metric units. So what's the theory? Well, before we go into the theory, it's always worth reminding yourself that the best way of finding out what the capacity of a pile is, is to test it. And you do various test loading. In fact, it's worth doing some test piles before you even uh, complete your design of your piles. And so therefore maybe modifying the design of the piles based on the test results. However, a, an approximate value may be determined from using the Hiley formula. And it's based on the idea that the resistance of the pile to further penetration under the permanent load is related to the resistance of, of the hammer the impact of the time of driving. So there are a number of these uh, dynamic pile formula available, and they're based on the laws governing dynamic impact of elastic bodies. And they equate the energy of the hammer blow to the work done in overcoming the resistance of the ground to the penetration of the pile. We also have to allow some of the energy to be lost due to elastic contractions of the pile the pile cap and the subsoil, as well as the losses caused by the inertia of the pile itself. So there is the highly formula. It looks nice and simple. And, and on the surface, it, it, it is. And the most of the parameters is fairly straightforward. The oddity is the C value and the N value or eta value that actually takes a little bit of working out. And the formula changes if you your pile is driven to refusal. So a little word about factors of safety. These are typically between one and a half and two and a half. Or to translate that into uh, New Zealand speak, your strength reduction factor would be between 0 0.667 two thirds uh, to about 0.4. And you want a large factor of safety or a low strength reduction factor where your settlements must be limited. Either you've got high live loads or impact loads are expected. And if you're relying on skin friction in a group of piles, you can use a small factor of safety if you're doing piling for temporary works where large settlements are permissible. 
So this is where you get to in our Redco Excel spreadsheet. You fire up Excel and under my templates, you will find foundations under foundations button. Just fire that up, click OK, and the Excel spreadsheet will fire up. However, we're not going to look at the Excel spreadsheet. We're going to look at the MathCAD version. And, uh, we'll go through the MathCAD calculation. It was done a few years ago, but I had to update it at the weekend um, because I found a few little niggles in it. So you put in your basic uh, input information. I have a convention where the input information I highlight in yellow and the calculations are then done in plain text. So the input is basically your pile diameter, your pile length, length, the weight of the hammer, and you can have an estimate for the weight of the anvil and the helmet and so on. Uh, you can derive the uh, pile unit weight, um, usually from timber tables, and then the actual weight of the pile itself based on its length of its area. So you put those all together uh, to get the p-value, and then you find out, uh, put in the free fall height of the hammer, in this case it's a meter. You add the efficiency of the fall, now that can often be uh, taken from the piling rig, if that's available. If not, a simple estimate is that use it as 80%. Uh, we've put in the final set here, which is S. Now, an S of 25 millimeters is, is a fairly high set, and I've deliberately done that to spit out the word easy for easy driving. And the coefficient of restitution, the E, comes from the appendix B of that civil engineering code of practice. And from the table, you get the E value of 0.25. The efficiency of the blow, eta, is calculated depending on whether your weight pile driving hammer is heavier than the um, weight of the pile and, and the anvil, et cetera. And you end up with two different formulas. So that's where I put in an if statement to achieve the eta value of 0.75. And then we carry on. So you're turning that potential energy of the hammer into a driving force. And from that, you get the stress in the piles due to the driving force. Now, why do we need that? Well, we need that to find out how strong or how difficult the driving is. So if generally, if you're below the 7 MPA mark, you're looking at easy driving. And if you're above the 14 MPA, uh, Mark, you're looking at very hard driving, and that makes a difference in the C values. And for the MathCAD geeks there, yes, that's a nested if statement. So you're almost into programming with MathCAD there. From our tables uh, in the code of practice, table eight, you can get your uh, C value, CC for the compression of the pile. And there's compression of the pile, the head and the dolly and the packing and the three values which you add together to get the 2.6 value I've got there. The elastic compression of the pile is also taken from that table to give you CP, which is related to the length of the pile. The quake again picked out and in there is now just 1.3. So you add all those together to get a grand total of 5.88 and that gives you the ultimate driving resistance using the highly formula as 58.38 kilonewtons. We have a strength reduction factor of 0.5 or a factor of safety of two. So our design load on that pile is 26 kilonewtons. So not a lot, but there, there it is. Now you would think you'd be able to produce a pile capacity table simply from that. And so we can use in this case, the table to produce uh, an array of values for the design resistance and the pile stresses. Now, the reason I put in the pile stresses is to show that the, the stress in the pile changes with the set. And so at the smaller sets, the driving goes from easy to medium, which means your table there is really only valid in the easy range. 
Um, so the plot function in MathCAD allows you to plot this diagram of your set versus your resistance. And I've put on the two lines there to show you where the limitations are. So when you're in this, this area, you're good. If you're in this area, you really need to be calculating the pile again with the revised values based on the stress in the pile. Uh, so this is the code of practice from uh, the civil engineering. And this gives you the values for CC, CP and CQ, which go together to get your total compressions. So there you see that the um, CC is based upon the compression in the head of the timber pile the dolly or helmet or driving cap if you're using that and any packing you're using and uh, so for timber you're adding these values together and it ranges from easy driving through to the very hard driving from a cc of 1.3 to to 5 and you and you add these values together if you've got a dolly and you've got a packing under there um cp is for the pile length and that gives you uh, values for timber, concrete and steel, again, ranging from easy to very hard driving. And the CQ for the quake, it ranges from 1.3 to 3.8. And it's a matter of engineering judgment which sort of values you put into these uh, as well. The calculation changes um, if you're driving it to refusal. Uh, so says the uh, uh, the code of practice and we we bring back the uh, basic parameters so we've already stated them before so my convention is to put restated uh, parameters in gray uh, this time you're looking at a different set so in theory your set is zero so it's driven to refusal now if you put that in the formula you'll end up with an error um, so you have to change the error uh, the, the, the formula slightly so again, we, we calculate the efficiency of the blow. Um, the, C, the CP, CC and CQ values uh, all change uh, because you're looking at very hard driving uh, in there because the stress is so much higher in there. You get your initial driving resistance based upon the, the first of the uh, highly formula, and then you get a modification factor which has pulled out the ratio of R to C. And so your ultimate driving resistance is given by this modification in there. So we're dropping it down quite a bit from 158 to 91. After you've uh, calculated your results, you need to bear in mind that this formula is not applicable to saturated silts or muds and clays. Um, because the resistance to the impact of the toe of the pile is exaggerated by the low permeability of the soil. And often your frictional resistance on the sides, so your skin friction is reduced during the driving by lubrication. So you've got saturated silts, which will squeeze up the pile, reducing its effectiveness. It's also not applicable to systems which provide an enlarged base to the foot of the pile, and that's normally done by uh, under reaming. Got to bear in mind that the tendency of the ground will to alter its resistance after driving should be ascertained by redriving the test piles and an occasional working pile. So you could be given a false sense of security with the strength of the pile based on the resistance that you get immediately upon driving. Sometimes you will ask for the pile to be redriven three days after your pile driving has completed to avoid the misleading results. There is potential for negative skin friction in piles. So in your, if you're in saturated soils with low permeability, you need to take account of the heave that can be generated or the lifting of adjacent piles that are already in if you're looking at a group of piles. And if you're in soft sensitive clays, the remolding can cause settlement due to its own weight and induce this downward acting negative skin friction. So you need to calculate the additional force due to this negative skin friction and deduct it from the capacity of the pile.
you can get significant and appreciable settlements uh, in driven piles when you're wholly embedded in clay. And in such situations, uh, forward piles may be preferable to driven piles. And if you're driving through a filled site, particularly if it's not been uh, well compacted, that deposit may settle and it will continue to settle. That will impose a load, an additional load on the pile. And again, that needs to be deducted from the pile capacity you've calculated. And finally, to the references in there. So it's the old um, verification method from the New Zealand Building Code and that Civil Engineering Code of Practice number four to explain it by Alistair Beale. My next seminar, hopefully in two weeks' time, we will be looking at a simple calculation to uh, verify whether our long span pre stressed floors are likely to vibrate under load.